say say it, Rajan. Yeah. I said, uh, do I address you as Dr. Shetty or as uh, whatever the uh, you can call me Devi, Dr. Shetty, whatever. Okay. You know. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Rajan, we can start. Okay. So very good afternoon uh, to all of you, ladies and gentlemen in, in India, and to all those others who are joining us from around the world. Uh, we are here on a fireside chat with Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, the chairman and founder of uh, Narayan Health, uh, as a person, a Padma Bhushan, someone who needs no introduction. Uh, here is a person we have who really represents healthcare for the masses, represents what healthcare in a Bharat context can be uh, for us today and for the world in the future as well. And uh, we are here on this fire chat, fireside chat, uh, which is entitled, I Have a Dream. So, uh, you know, very, very warm welcome uh, to you, uh, Devi, to be with us here on this uh, conversation. And, you know, it's really about us capturing your dream for India uh, as we move forward. I mean, you have anyway set the bar to where we are today, but really, if you were able to see India as we move from India at 75, the India of 2022 to India at 100, you know, the India of 2047, how would you visualize healthcare in this country? Where would you see, you know, the participation of multi-stakeholders, whether it's government, private sector, civil society, academia? How do we all come together to really see that we can provide affordable healthcare to, to all citizens as well as, you know, ensure that India as a country is at the forefront on the world stage, you know, when it comes to healthcare. So, with those few opening comments, uh, you know, uh, let me let me start, uh, you know, by uh, asking you, like, you know, we are sitting here today, uh, you know, in, in March 2022, uh, you know, we are in our 75th year of uh, Indian independence. Uh, we have achieved a lot, you know, as a country, uh, ever since we became independent, a uh, lot has happened in the last, you, you know, maybe seven, eight years uh, since 2014 when the current central administration has come in, you know, a lot has changed in the world of healthcare as well. Uh, but if you were to look at, you know, where we are today on a board footing, you know, what would be those two or three issues that, you know, we must address uh, as where we are today uh, before we really even think of, you know, really moving forward. So what is the what are those issues that are on top of your mind, uh, if I would, if I may ask, uh, to, to kickstart this conversation? Yeah, uh, Rajan, I strongly believe that uh, India will become the first country in the world to dissociate healthcare from affluence. India will prove to the world that the wealth of the nation has nothing to do with the quality of healthcare its citizens can enjoy. It's exactly like how India managed to dissociate mobile communication from affluence. Uh, India will do the same thing in healthcare. Why I am so optimistic that India can do it? Mainly because healthcare is predominantly driven by people, people with the passion and empathy. And I strongly believe that Indians are a group of people who are born with the passion, empathy, and the skill and the magic in their fingers. Most of the Indians, it comes natural to us. So we are actually uh, genetically designed to be healers. So with a little bit of education and a right environment, we can create a wonderful healthcare system as we have shown. So that is, I wouldn't say it's my wish list. I know it is going to happen and it will happen very soon. Uh, now for this to happen, there is a very important missing link. Uh, earlier, all of us talked about affordable healthcare. Healthcare costs should go down. It should become affordable to the common man. The most of the Indian hospitals have successfully driven down the cost of healthcare to such a level 
that further reduction may not be possible in that context. I'll give you a reason why I'm convinced that pushing the price down further is not the option. Uh, I left England in 1989. And the first patient I operated in Calcutta, that's about, I think, more than 32 years ago, uh, paid one and a half lakh rupees for a heart operation 32 years ago. Today, we are doing the same operation with perhaps better outcome for 90,000 rupees, 1 lakh rupees. That's all what the, most of the government schemes pay us. Yeah, and we are able to do it. Tell me what was costing 1.5 lakh 32 years ago. Today is done uh, at half the price. There is nothing anywhere in the world this phenomena has happened. Now, can you push it further? No, you can't push it further. If you try to push it further, you can only compromise on the quality. If you want to maintain good quality healthcare, we have reached the rock bottom price. But even when I say 80,000, 90,000 rupees, uh, how many people in the country can afford to pay? Paying for the healthcare from the pocket is not the best option available to any part of the world. There has to be a financial intermediary to pay for the healthcare. And this financial intermediary is essentially collecting money from large number of people, millions and millions of people, and paying for a small percentage of the people who need healthcare. That is the way healthcare is designed across the world. In uh, European countries, most of the European countries, government is a financial intermediary. They have a fantastic tax collection mechanism and the population is small and they are able to pay for it. In US on the other side is mainly dependent on the private insurance programs because country is a wealthy country. There are enough people who are earning huge money so they can pay for it and somehow the system goes on. In India, the only option we have which our government should dramatically embrace is creating large number of financial intermediaries working like uh, health insurance companies. May not be exactly like financial in, uh, the, the insurance companies. This is exactly like we have a very robust banking system, but the tiny, tiny NBFCs and all of them uh, self-help groups came forward collected money in small numbers and try to look after the community, the same thing should happen. There should be a fintech revolution in uh, health insurance or a health financial intermediary uh, role. And what is the shape of it? Nobody knows. It will only happen if there is a free market forces playing and large number of players are allowed to take part in this, some will survive, some will die. Like the, uh, there, is, there are a few app-based health insurance programs which are coming up and uh, they are promising to cover up to 1 lakh rupees of healthcare expenses by a premium of 999 rupees. Now we may think that it is absurd, but no one knows there is a possibility that if they live to see the fifth year of operation, I'm sure they would have figured out what works, what doesn't work. It will work mainly because it is not that if 100 people are covered by health insurance program, all of them fall sick at the same time. So essentially, government has to look at creating the financial intermediaries of all sizes and shapes knowing fully well that there will be a lot of problems in the process, but in the end, a successful model will emerge. That is the second thing. The third thing what will happen, why I am bullish on the healthcare, uh, being getting dissociated with affluence, is the digital platform on which healthcare will be delivered. The, uh, 
I have no doubt that within the next few years, maybe in the next the the four or five years, uh, smart software will make smarter diagnosis than the doctors. And in the near future, it will become legally mandatory for the doctors to get the second opinion from the software before starting the treatment. Now, does it mean doctors are not required? Certainly not. The, all these tools will make doctors safer for the patients. All these tools will make doctors more productive for the patients. The, it is a matter of time before uh, most of the patients will have the first time consultation for headache or a heart attack or a cancer online. Online healthcare will become the norm, which has already become the norm. When that happens, physical distance is immaterial, time is immaterial, location is immaterial, everything will change. Now, when I'm talking about legally mandatory for the doctors to prescribe medicine, uh, the, uh, doctors to get the second opinion, uh, five years ago, the Chief Justice, one of, I think, Chief Justice of Uttarakhand uh, State passed a uh, judgment that in the state of Uttarakhand, no doctor can prescribe medicine on a paper. It has to be on a digital platform. Unfortunately, they couldn't implement it because the infrastructure wasn't there. But it is a matter of time before infrastructure becomes available. Now, once all the paper and whatever we do on a paper gets moved to the digital platform, the healthcare will become much, much safer for the patient. Because a lot of the time, patients land in trouble in the hospital, not because doctors didn't do their job. For the doctors to do the job, they need the data. And the data comes from various machines. And there is a huge time lag between the machines spitting out the results and doctors seeing the reports. Now that will be bridged by all the electronic medical records getting shifted from the desktop to the mobile phone. Now, why it is important for the shifting? It is important because doctors look at the desktop five to six times in a day, but they look at their mobile phone 200 times in a day. So if you really want doctor's attention, the best way is entire electronic medical records getting shifted to the mobile phone. Like today, uh, our uh, software team, five years ago, they developed a electronic medical records for us, which is so advanced. I go to bed around 11 o'clock at night. Before I go to sleep, I do the ICU rounds. I know exactly what is the state of the, of the patient. I can see the patient. I can talk to the patient. I can uh, uh, talk to the nurses, doctors. I can even spot the color of urine sitting in my bedroom. That is a degree of data uh, visualization in the mobile phone. And I get up at uh, half past four in the morning. First thing I do is to do the ICU rounds. Before I enter the building early morning, I would have finished my rounds. Or I have seen all my patients. I know exactly what is happening. So it doesn't matter whether I'm in Bangalore or Delhi or wherever I am. It doesn't matter. So not only me, 20 of my team members are constantly interacting with each other, round the clock virtually, about our patients. That's amazing uh, uh, tools we have. All these tools will add significantly to the outcome. And all these digital technologies, what we have developed in the country by various hospitals, will make healthcare accessible to every patient. So when the concept of Technology, skilled people, passion, empathy, financial intermediary, when all these things come together, it's a different world altogether, Raja. No, I think you have so beautifully captured the dream of not only one person like yourself, but of what would be of so many different people who wish the same for India. So 
I must uh, firstly thank you for really putting this in such a, a simple language, but you know, in complete perspective. And you know, what you talk particularly about the mobile phone and the financial systems, you know, which have proliferated across India. It's only a matter of time that that same level of proliferation, when it comes to the word healthcare, you know, will it will happen. And the tools that you described so beautifully talk about it. And you know, the whole journey of transformation of India, you know, they, when we looked at this from a India at 75 vision, now moving to India at 100, is exactly on the lines of the innovation happening with non-negotiables for a country like India, right? So I know in the earlier journey, we used to talk of price performance will only move in one direction, right? And that is affordability. And you've seen that, you rightly said in 30 years, we've seen that move, we've reached a point where that cannot probably be the way forward. And that's the beauty of where this journey from 75 to 100 will happen where the ways that have helped us get here will not take us there. And therefore, this disruptive year for us to think together as to how can we change the path you know, for our country. And I think so beautifully captured what needs to happen with policy, with industry, and all the trends that are already natural in India. Maybe one you know, point that would be good for us to also discuss a little more and understand better is, you know, you just walked out of a surgery, like you rightly, uh, you know, it's very visible. You know, when it comes to best practices as healthcare organizations, right, in India, uh, I mean, you are an exemplar in that direction as far as, you know, your institution is concerned. What, what have been the key learnings? What do you feel healthcare organizations should really be doing a lot more of? if we are to realize all of these aspects that we have talked of, you know, as we move forward. Rajan, the most important uh, issue which every healthcare organization should look at is training the future healthcare workforce. Because we are not really uh, understanding the gravity of situation, uh, which is happening now, which will unfold in the near future that is acute shortage of doctors, nurses, and medical technicians. This will have a massive impact on our, our healthcare, of course, the global healthcare. Now, COVID-19 has totally turned our world upside down. Uh, the historians, 100 years from now, if they're ever going to write the history of the world, there will be two periods. One is uh, BC, that is before COVID. Other one is AC, after COVID. Now, every country has realized the importance of a robust healthcare system and the need of technically skilled, passionate people. Unfortunately, in the developed countries, healthcare profession is not very attractive for bright young people. Nobody wants to be stuck up in a hospital, constantly listening to somebody in pain. You need to be made up of a different material. But we are an exceptional group of people. Now, all those countries, in the past, they raised so much of embargo on foreign doctors, especially Indian doctors entering those countries. I have seen all those gates falling very, very quickly. When I was uh, a young doctor trying to go to England, I had to go to England in advance, go to the training program. I had to appear for the exam and a very small percentage of the people who appeared for the exam passed the exam and they managed to get in. Today, you have a postgraduate degree from any Indian university. You can virtually walk into any of the British uh, National Health Service hospitals and straight away get a very, very well-paying job, which will give you whatever training you want. In good old days, nurses from India had so much of difficulty in getting a job in England or other countries. Today, every country uh, is embracing these doctors and nurses. Yes, yesterday I was speaking to one of the administrators of one of the uh, trust hospitals in England, NHS hospital. He was asking me that, look, you have a heart hospital, you got so many trained uh, x-ray technicians, radiology, radiographers, CT scan technicians. 
can you send them to my uh, hospital we are willing to pay them huge salary i mean their salary structure is obviously much then i asked them do you you know if you ask them to appear for the exam our kids will find it difficult to because they have to pass those english language test, this test hundred different tests. they said no 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 if you certify them that they are competent we'll take them so this is the situation now these things are going to have a massive impact on india because we'll be training large number of people they will there is 80 million healthcare workforce shortage across the world and the prime target is going to be our country and there is nothing you can do to prevent that exodus and you know to train a hand surgeon it takes about 14 years forget about any other surgeon so essentially it's not easy for us to reproduce these skilled manpower manpower very fast so it is very very important that every hospital takes up training as the uh, a priority and the government policies help in creating and producing more and more number of doctors, nurses and technicians. Time has gone as Indian policymakers thinking about what is the need of the number of doctors for India. We should ask ourselves what is the need for doctors across the world because we are going to be the prime supplier of medical manpower to the world. A few years ago, Harvard Business School conducted a survey, a study, and they published the results. And the results showed that the Americans who were treated by expert doctors, mainly Indians, lived longer than the American doctors who are treated by American doctors. So there is no doubt about how competent, how skilled, and how empathetic our doctors are. So it is a great opportunity. We can look at it both ways. We can say that, okay, it's going to be a brain drain. But at the same time, we can look at, if we train just 5 million doctors, nurses, and technicians, we can easily earn $100 billion of foreign currency every year, $100 billion. I'll give you the data. Cuba earns about nine or ten billion dollars of foreign currency just it's a small country it's about nearly uh, nearly 35 37 percent of their uh, uh, foreign currency earning just by selling sending few thousand doctors and nurses to uh, developing countries and uh, philippines earns huge i think about 39 billion dollars it's a huge amount of money uh, by sending their nurses and doctors to other countries. So we have a phenomenal opportunity. We have a hospital in Cayman Island where about 100 nurses who are trained by us, individually they are sending home every month 1 lakh rupees to every household they come from. And these girls are hardly 23, 24 years old. All they did was four years of BSc nursing in India in a hospital like ours. And good number of them after two years, less than two years, earlier it was five, six years. After two years, they migrate to England and they earn 10 times more. So this is the opportunity we have. We can look at it as a liability, but if our policymakers look at it as an opportunity and create the right environment for large number of nursing colleges, medical colleges, all the other technical uh, med paramedical education to come up, it is going to be a game changer. Because when these Indian doctors, nurses go to the Western countries, earn a huge amount of money, a part of the money goes back to the small households from rural India. Because most of the nurses come from that part of the world. It will have a massive impact on the upliftment of the real, you know, work, the, the, the so lower socioeconomic strata. So we are actually staring at a great opportunity, which I feel we should encash. I think, you know, your, your observation is so bang on, and I think it needs to get further strengthened over the next 25 years, because, you know, it comes once in the lifetime of a nation, Devi, that you know, one in ten people in the world is an Indian under the age of 25, right? It, it doesn't happen very often in the life of any country. And one of the things we always said, you know, with India at 75 is that the capacity.
capacity or the ability for us to build human capacity through skills you know in large numbers of indians uh, at a time when the world is facing a crisis when it comes to aging populations is probably the best way for india to achieve a position of global leadership and given the values that indians have we talked about empathy and the way we have an upbringing here you know the difference that we can make in the lives of people around the world is you forget the the you know the the money that comes back or you know that the, the the way the economic progress will happen but the good the true good that we can provide to the world is 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 just you know waiting for us to tap in so very beautifully captured and completely you know take that part and to your other point that you mentioned you know my father in law just two weeks ago had a surgery in the us at one of the leading um, you know again cardiac institutes there the second time and i can tell you it was the bc and ac effect you know when we went before covid what what was the experience there you know with both with nursing with the, the staff and everyone was an exact 180 degree opposite thing you know uh, post covid i mean it's 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 that drastic right whether it is the availability of people one person attending to too many patients and this is in some of the world's leading institutes so i fully get what you're saying covid has also played a big role probably in in you know seeing how indians and people from india can really rise to the occasion as long as the world is accepting of of such things and i'm going to and i agree with you that you know that's going to happen but you know alongside this and you very rightly you did mention this in your opening comments you know technology is also moving very rapidly right so you know things like telehealth you know ai in in healthcare you know like you rightly said there's a lot of second opinion coming from software right and 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 these emerging technologies that are also moving the scale you know very rapidly so if you were to really go a little step deeper you know what would be the impact of these technologies uh, and really the gaps in the healthcare system where a large part of these skills can you know get filled you know if you were to really map the world maybe 25 years from today what kind of capabilities in healthcare would you see that we should be as a country focusing on see the it's very interesting uh we have a kind of a complex in terms of our ability to do things i'll i'll give you an example like uh, i was observing uh, iit kanpur I, you know iit kanpur one of the most innovative iit is they are the ones who developed one of the ventilators in a record period of time during the covid crisis and uh, they were looking at the next equipment healthcare equipment to manufacture and i was closely following their uh, discussion a lot of suggestions came about cardiac monitors and this machine that machine in the end all of them uniformly decided that we should develop the most advanced most complex machine for the healthcare and they zero down on the artificial heart now artificial hearts are made by only one or two companies in the world and in india today it costs it's called elvad left ventricular assist device it costs uh, about 70 to 80 lakh rupees for this procedure to be done mainly because of the uh, huge cost of the equipment called left ventricular it's a, it's a pump which is implanted on patients in terminal heart failure instead of the heart transplant now i was i realized why they chose elvad as the product they have to make it is exactly for me it is exactly like president kennedy announcing that we want to put man on the moon and everything else is a minor detail like he had the audacity to visualize that in 10 years we should put the man on the moon and how the entire countries uh approach towards uh, uh the 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 space ship and the way the the moon uh thing was planned it was exactly like for me even though i read about those things as a kid about the moon mission reliving the whole thing with their mission and the way they have gone about it is amazing 
it is a it is a one of the best stories for any one who wants to transform the entire idea of what a nation is what they want to do first thing they said okay we are going to do it but they they know they have a lot of expertise but in this is a something foreign to them so they have a huge network of all their alumni and the contacts in no time they identified some of the best minds in artificial hearts from us europe all over the world and i could see doctors who are working in real real prestigious american universities spending their whole professional life in managing these patients on artificial heart offering their services virtually willing to leave their job and stay in iit kanpur for 2 years to help them to build it and they have identified the some of the brightest minds and they are financing it in the end when the product comes out the ip right is for these young people i think seven or eight people in that company they are creating it is theirs and they are the first right of refusal to build it so the essentially they have addressed all the problems of a startup you have no capital risk you have the brightest minds advising they even tied up with all the top heart hospitals of the country as advisors who are eventually going to be the buyers so they tied up the market as well so this is an example of what india can do like this tomorrow if one of the iits decides that they want to build the most advanced drone military drone in no time they will be able to get the most talented people in that area bring them together and in one or two years time come up with the product then one of the most successful you know the the drone company can be built so i was truly amazed and i can tell you that in the next uh, within the next two years i have no doubt that this group of people will come up with the most advanced artificial heart anyone can create because these all the advisors and people are involved they know the shortcomings of each and every artificial heart and they know how to overcome this and since it is iit kanpur is obviously part of the indian government's infrastructure so obviously it has the blessings of the government and that is a phenomenal combination and they can truly conquer the world i am so excited when i was watching these changes happening in the way these institutions so called you know the the traditional education institutions coming up and changing the way they run it's truly remarkable your anecdote is is so you know again pointed because it brings all the multi stakeholders right we talked of academicians the experts in the world government alignment private sector because i'm sure once we grab that technology all the hospitals in in india will be big beneficiaries of you know uh, being able to perform you know these surgeries and and in india and in a way you know there is because there is a huge discussion always on you know medical tourism and wellness tourism to india you know india is home to ayurveda alternative medicine so much of richness in the history of what we have done and you know you talked of countries like philippines and others really being exports to the world for skill manpower right do you ever see wellness and medical tourism you know also accelerating in a in a country like india given what you just mentioned in terms of the uh, technologies and so many other things that are then happening also the affordability see the 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 geopolitical situation and the uh, way the most of the developing countries are stuck in some places uh the oh, one of the best places for them to uh, access tertiary healthcare is going to be india and in india the entire cost structure is dramatically different compared to other countries i'll give you an example the uh, the uh, car t cell therapy for uh, advanced malignancy like blood cancer in us costs about a million dollar it's like a cell therapy like a cancer treatment 
from surgery to uh, dreadful, you know, all these chemical drugs which are potentially toxic to the body. Now it is going to cell therapy, which has relatively less uh, side effects. Uh, it's called CAR T cell therapy, and it's very, very expensive. May not many Americans can also afford it. Now, in India, the, like we have just started CAR T cell therapy uh, uh, here, and the still on the trial. And we believe that it will be a fraction of what is going to cost in US. When that happens, even Americans who cannot afford the CAR T cell therapy have no choice, they have to come to India. So the essentially it is not about low cost healthcare. It is about high tech affordable care, which not many countries have the expertise or the infrastructure or the, you know, the capability to uh, manage. And we are a very, very unique country in uh, developing those technologies in-house and then reducing the cost and making it affordable and making it scalable. No, I, I think technological vitality, as you say, is the driver which will give us economic strength and everything else, which have been, you know, again, the underlying themes, you know, for, for, for all of this, you know, as we, as we move forward. I think it's been, you know, we've talked about so many different aspects about healthcare, about affordability, you know, the way the IT sector, you know, put India on the global map, you know, today, so many of Indians are leading IT companies around the world. You know, engineers are wanted everywhere in the world, you know, as Indians. And I, from my conversation, uh, you know, uh, maybe I'm sensing that whether it's the top of the pyramid, the best doctors in the world, you know, whether it is the, the nursing affordability, the technology in healthcare that will drive this is very much similar, you know, in terms of a transformation as we move, you know, to, to 2047. So again, you know, really coming to 2047 since we just have a few more minutes and I promised you that I will let you go, you know, in 45 minutes and we can keep going on. But, you know, if you if you were to look at the Indian uh, in 2047, you know, as the center, right, and, and health around that person <clears throat> as one of the primary needs or what we would say social infrastructure that we as a country have to provide, you know, to, to, to every citizen. Right? What would be the key components right, that, that we cannot do without? So one was, of course, you talked of the financial piece around it and how we would need intermediaries and others, technology. But if we were to put you know, the citizen at the center and really look and map the health around that citizen, you know, what would that journey or what would that experience really be for the citizen, whether it is in, in monitoring, whether it is in diagnosis, whether it is in capturing? I mean, give us a vision on, on, on how that would look. Rajan, the, uh, I have only two priorities today, uh, what I expect my country to do. One is invest on healthcare education, and the most important thing, which is added to my list right on top, only recently, after the development of whatever is happening in the Ukraine and Russia, and uh, we have to look at in investing on defense technology so that we become a country with the most advanced tools to protect ourselves. For two reasons I want it to happen. One is for the security of the nation, and the second reason is that every product which is saving millions of lives today, starting from CT scan, ultras, MRI, ultrasound, lasers, all of them are products from defense. They are not developed for the healthcare. Anything what you develop for the defense, eventually it will come to healthcare. So if our policies of the government is to really go out of the way to support all the innovative tools for uh, military purposes. It will have far reaching impact on the healthcare and more than anything else, it will be, make us a self-reliant nation. Today, if a country is not reliant, a large country like ours, 
uh, is not reliant on uh, our own production of the defense equipments, we are very, very vulnerable. Everything else what you have, no meaning. If we do not, uh, if we are not technologically far, far superior than the rest, and we can do it because these are the tools which can be developed by our brilliant minds. It's just that we have to look at it as a national priority. No, I think, you know, this interdisciplinary objective of looking at defense, technology, applying it to healthcare at a time when there's so much change happening in the world that is beyond our control is really the way for us to, to also envision this. Uh, you know, it's been such a joy they be chatting with you and I know we can continue to go on and on. I share the 4.30 wake up uh, experience with you as well. And, 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 I, and, I can, and I can, you know, really uh, endorse the energy that comes when you wake up at that hour to be able to go through the day. And I can only, uh, you know, uh, understand the, the kind of things that you are packing into your day and doing such lovely service, both in action uh, and what we have captured with you today is, is in mind and thought and vision. And, you know, all I can say is that, that your dream is truly ambitious uh, for us as a country. And I think if we all work together, uh, it will definitely become a reality. So thank you uh, for joining us for this lovely conversation and look forward you know, to your continued engagement as we move uh, as a country from India at 75 to India at 100 and keep measuring ourselves you know, in the light of changes that are happening and course correct and really live the dreams of, of, that, of the great healthcare experience to all of us. So thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Rajan. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Shetty. Thank you, Rajan.